Um, tonight's talk is sponsored by the College Scholars Program. This is a program that provides stipends to JCC faculty, both full and part-time, for the development of their research. Uh, faculty present two uh, presentations, talks, one in the evening, one in the uh, daytime, and then they either go and lecture at another professor's class or they present a faculty uh, presentation of their choice. Um, there's a lot of former college scholars in the audience, I see, and some people who really should have applied at this point. <laughs> um, college Scholars was started by Dr. Jim Liker in the History Department to provide a platform for JCCC faculty to present their research projects. Those of us who are involved in the program feel it is important for several reasons. First and foremost, it gives uh, community college faculty a chance to present their research which is, and to continue their research, which is not easy to do when you teach at a community college because of course the focus is on teaching. Um, secondly, I believe that programs like the College Scholars make for better teachers. Um, uh, professors who can pursue their own interests, bring an enthusiasm to the classroom um, that really can't be duplicated. And so it enriches not only our experience but also the experiences of our students. And finally, I think that College Scholars is a way uh, for JCCC and the community to reach out and sort of meet each other, right? And uh, we have community members that always come to these talks, and there's always wonderful exchanges during the question and answer period between the presenters and the audience. Um, and so now, on to our speaker. Dr. Derek Taylor received his PhD in British History from the University of Kansas in 2011. His dissertation, entitled The Strange, His Life, Public and Persona in the Life of Sir Roger the Strange, 1616-1704, explored the cultural and intellectual milieu of late medieval and early modern Europe through the figure of the Strange, a pamphleteer who supported the royalist side in the English Civil Wars. Since receiving his degree, Dr. Taylor has taught here at JCCC, as well as at KU and Mid-American Nazarene University. He has taught a wide variety of courses, including U.S. history, Western Civ, British history, and world civilizations. His presentation tonight, entitled The Free Gift of Health, John Locke and Early Modern Medicine, takes a fresh approach in examining the philosopher John Locke. Rather than staying on the well-trodden path of assessing Locke's contributions to the Enlightenment, Dr. Taylor will instead use Locke's ideas about Christianity, health, and sickness to draw broader conclusions about the relationship between faith and medicine in mid-17th century Europe. I'm pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Derek Taylor. Uh, ah, well, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all coming here tonight, all of you. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, my talk tonight is on John Locke, and we'll start out giving you a little background. Most of you probably know who John Locke is. He's the great Enlightenment philosopher. Um, usually associated with a couple of big ideas. He's one of those great thinkers who had two big ideas instead of one. Uh, one being his um, social contract theory, usually associated with his two treatises of government, uh, in which he uh, sets out a theory of government by the consent of the governed. Uh, and then his essay concerning human understanding. Those are the two jewels in the crown of his, his, uh, his work. And the essay, of course, is his uh, exposition of his empiricist understanding of the human mind. The idea that we come to our knowledge not through innate ideas or something built into nature, programmed, if you like, uh, but through um, reflection on our sensory experiences. Uh, and so our minds are a tabula rasa in his famous, his famous understanding of things. And so he's, of course, traditionally viewed as a very radical thinker, in which he was in philosophical terms and uh, political terms in the 17th century. But the question uh, my research, my current research, deal with, um, which I'm writing an article on, is was he as radical a thinker in medical terms as he was in those philosophical and uh, political terms? Uh, and not to leave you in suspense, my answer is a qualified no. And so I'm going to go through the nice, uh, lay out some background for his life, uh, his religious beliefs, but also uh, medicine and how he practiced it in the 17th century, and maybe answer that question for you, how I'm going to answer it in my, uh, in my article. 
So I wanted to start out uh, talking about uh, his religious faith. And most scholars agree at this point that he did have uh, an upbringing in a Puritan home in 17th century England. He's born in 1632, uh, dies in 1704. I should give you the timeline here. And his father was almost certainly a Puritan, um, as, was, uh, as were other members of his family. And uh, we know this from his father's notebooks. Uh, they tend to uh, detail certain religious elements, um, which um, tip us off of this, uh, as well as the fact that the area he's born in, Somerset, southern England, was supportive of the parliamentary side during the English Civil Wars. He's born 10 years before England, uh, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales are plunged into civil war, uh, the supporters of Charles I versus the supporters of Parliament. Uh, not every supporter of Parliament is a Puritan, but there's a correlation. Almost all the Puritans are on the side of Parliament. And if you don't know what that word Puritan means, just generally speaking, it's a Protestant, normally conforming to the legally established Church of England, which Henry VIII started after the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but someone who thinks the church hasn't been properly reformed. They think it's still too connected to its Catholic past. They don't like the sort of Catholic accoutrements that the Church of England still has, bishops, fancy dress for priests and stuff like this. And it appears that that's the environment that he grew up in uh, as a child. And one thing to note as well, uh, he knows lots of people but, uh, who fought in the Civil War on the parliamentary side. His father fought on the parliamentary side in the Civil War. So those two uh, political and religious items are a real, they mark him out uh, uh, a real specific path early in life. In terms of his faith and practice, in terms of what he did, he didn't actually leave us a lot of evidence. Uh, very little evidence about his religious worship, for example. We do know that in the late 1660s, uh, when he's in London, he'll attend the sermons of a friend of his, Benjamin Witchcote, who's a clergyman uh, at a parish there. And he does like attending sermons. Uh, but we really don't know the depth uh, of his uh, commitment to doing that. Uh, nor does he actually leave any prayer books behind. Uh, doesn't leave any uh, notebooks full of you know, diaries with religious uh, you know, or spiritual uh, musings in them. I say this because most pious Protestant, Protestant Christians in the 17th century did so. And so Locke isn't on that, on that sort of trajectory. Um, he does leave much writing on theology, however. Um, most of it coming from the later, latter part of his life, I'd say the 1670s onward. And I think it's safe to say, I don't think any scholar of Locke would disagree with at this point, theology is central to virtually everything he writes. You really can't get away from it um, in his philosophy, in his political works. Um, it's very important to him in a lot of different ways. And so um, you have this sense that he's someone who, it's very central to his thought, but he's not necessarily the most devout person in the world. Um, sort of, you know, like a lot of people I would think who are religious believers, not necessarily the most devout, the most pious, but he does believe uh, something that most scholars accept these days. One thing I will uh, say, uh, early in his career, he's very clear on, um, when he first starts addressing public issues in the early 1660s, um, he's against religious toleration for non-conforming Protestants, Protestants who uh, reject the uh, beliefs of the legally established church, can in good conscience adhere to it. Their churches are made illegal, uh, and there are fairly draconian laws that are passed against them. Uh, initially, he's against this, but he changes his mind by the end of the 1660s and begins writing on toleration at that point. As I'm going to explain later, this is partly because of a particular network that he uh, comes into in the late 1660s, which begins to change his thinking about this, and also, as I want to argue, um, uh, spurs his thinking about medicine and philosophy as well. In terms of the, the specifics of his beliefs, um, Locke, uh, and I have to mention this because it's part of my argument, uh, Locke takes in terms of, well, I, I should step back and say that the obvious, he's a Protestant Christian. Uh, he's not Catholic, like most people in 17th century England. He's fairly anti-Catholic. Um, but I want to specifically mention his view of God, as, he, as this appears in some of his philosophical writings, his early political writings especially. He takes a fairly legalistic and voluntaristic view of God. And what that means basically is, in layman's terms, he sees God primarily as a lawgiver, someone who lays down the laws of nature, um, lays down moral laws that human beings have to follow. And uh, he's more defined by his power to do that than anything else. Voluntarism just means will. He's defined by his will. And this is a fairly commonplace way of looking at God for intellectuals in the 17th century. The opposite, by the way, if you're wondering 
would be, um, uh, as opposed to a voluntaristic understanding of the deity, would be an intellectualist or a rationalist version of this, which would put the emphasis not on God's will or his power, but on his reason. God has rationality, logos. Um, Thomas Aquinas, the medieval thinker, is probably the most, um, the best example of this. But in the 17th century, most Christians, Protestant and Catholic, take that latter, uh, that latter view. And uh, as a result, his view of Christianity, Locke, is that it's mostly about morality. Uh, Christianity teaches people how to act rightly so they can live, good, live a good life and go to heaven, basically. Um, I say that in the sense that he does not emphasize too much the supernatural aspects of Christianity. Uh, they're kind of downplayed in his, uh, in his works. Um, he's also, I mentioned he's a Protestant Christian, he sees the Bible as the only authority for this. Uh, he is very much a... Um, well, a proponent of a form of sola scriptura. Uh, the Bible, at least where it talks about salvation, is perfectly clear if you know how to read it and you read it carefully. Uh, and that's all you need to do, basically, in Locke's mind. Um, and as a result of this, there is, a, in Locke's thinking, because you have to be a good person to get to heaven, there is, uh, he makes a big issue out of the necessity of eternal rewards and punishments. You have to know how to act like a good person because you will be judged at the end of time. And I, I'll linger on this for a moment because one of the problems that Locke uh, and a lot of other thinkers have in the 17th century is that they are very worried about atheism and materialism. And they see around them, and they mention this in their writings all the time, where you see all these good people dying and suffering for no apparent reason. You see these bad people who get away with all these things. Um, this wouldn't make sense to Locke without having, okay, if you're not getting punished in this life, you must have that in the next one. Um, and so you need to have those, uh, those rewards and punishments in his mind. And that's what salvation means, I should, I should say. One other thing that goes along with this, and this kind of goes back to his, his Puritan upbringing, this also leads him to the idea of the necessity of good works for salvation. Uh, and that may sound obvious given what I just said. But remember, he was raised in a Puritan household, which not all Puritans were Calvinists, but a lot of them were. Uh, and he's definitely familiar with Calvin. He's read his works. Uh, and John Calvin, if you don't know, was the Protestant reformer of the 16th century who took a very, very harsh line on what's sometimes called predestination, the idea that God preordains who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, and that's basically that you have no free will with regards to this. And Locke uh, hated this and rejected it uh, out of hand, as did many of his contemporaries who had been raised in those homes. So it's kind of a reaction to certain ways against this. In the 1670s, and the first evidence for this emerges in the 1670s about his beliefs, I'll mention this along with them, although they might seem religious at first, um, Locke begins to take on the view that people are motivated, um, psychologically speaking, in terms of immoral terms, by pleasure and pain. That is to say, we're motivated to do what is good because we think it's pleasurable and do what is uh, bad because we uh, avoid what is bad because we think it's painful. And this is sometimes called uh, psychological hedonism, the idea we're, we're motivated by pleasure and pain. Uh, but he takes that one step further uh, and uh, advocates what we might, what uh, can be called ethical hedonism, that not only are we motivated by those, those things, but that what is good is actually pleasurable, always pleasurable, and what is bad is always painful. Uh, and he does this for uh, specific reasons, partly having to do with um, again, the problem of moral motivation. How do we get people to act good? Um, what good is virtue if there's no pleasure uh, attached to it? What good is uh, avoiding to avoid vice if it's pleasing? And so he takes on this uh, fairly controversial uh, belief in the 1670s, but it's related to, again, his idea of salvation, which I'll come back to at the end of this uh, lecture. And then finally, by the end of his life, and his beliefs change over time, uh, he's beginning to jettison uh, traditional Christian doctrines. Most scholars are pretty clear he's, by the end of his life, he doesn't believe in things like original sin, that human beings are born in this world with a tendency to sin or the guilt of Adam on their consciences. Uh, and he probably, it's not terribly clear, also rejects doctrines like the doctrine of the Trinity. He's very coy about it, um, <clears throat> mostly for very good reasons, because you can be severely punished by law if you don't adhere to the, to the uh, Trinitarian doctrines in the 17th century. Uh, and so, and one other, a couple of other things to uh, note about this. One is that most of these uh, beliefs I'm describing here are his mature beliefs. He really doesn't start writing about religion uh, in a big way until the latter parts of his life. Uh, I mention this because a lot of his medical works, uh, a lot of medical writing started in a much earlier period, so I'll keep that in mind here. Uh, and lastly, I'll also mention that his beliefs are kind of similar to uh, the beliefs of a group of clergymen in the uh, Church of England during his lifetime. Uh, and they're called latitudinarians, um, and they're called that because they, 
they want they agree with the idea of tolerating uh, non-conforming Protestant sects, or at least uh, dumbing down, if you like, uh, the religious the standards for religious adherence to the Church of England so they can be comprehended within it. Um, they have a similar emphasis on morality as being the central message of Jesus. Jesus is now, you know, not atoning for our sins necessarily. Well, most of them don't reject that. I think Locke pretty much does. Uh, but the main thing is he's bringing us the message, of right message of how to live. That's also similar to Locke. And they also, like John Locke, have the idea that Christianity needs to be simplified, that it can be and should be reduced to a few simple rules. John Locke, in the preface to his uh, Reasonableness of Christianity, which is his work in defense of Christian revelation in 1695, says in the introduction that he found the Bible so easy to under understand when read properly, I'm paraphrasing from memory, um, that he wondered that everybody else didn't see it the same way. Uh, and so he thinks these things are really actually just clear. People just, you know, because of superstition, because of ignorance, are actually getting them wrong. Uh, and I mention this because, as we're going to see, he has a fairly, very similar view, analogous view, to medicine. Uh, so that kind of leads to my transition. What does all that have to do with medicine? Uh, we we'll are get into the medical part of it here. Because uh, I need to step back and talk about the medical profession in the 17th century uh, and medicine in general, which, a few general remarks. The first thing to note is that it really isn't very professionalized in the 17th century. Um, that is to say, medical knowledge is not uh, a body of expert knowledge, which only professionals control. You know, you, sometimes you go to a doctor and he says something to you and you go, can you put that in layman's terms? Um, you don't have to do that in the 17th century because everyone's basically speaking the same language. Um, literally the same language is shared by patients and doctors. You know, you go to a doctor today, uh, you may take your blood pressure, or they take a stethoscope and check your, check your breathing. Um, they will, you know, take x-rays. None of that happens. Um, their diagnosis is basically this. Well, how do you feel? And you'll tell them how you feel, and that's how they make diagnoses in the 17th century. It's a very different experience um, than you would have today. Um, and so what I'm basically saying here is there's, there are, and I'll, I'll explain this in a moment, people who are licensed as doctors, but you do not need uh, that to practice medicine in the 17th century. The vast majority of people who do this don't. Uh, virtually anyone can be called a doctor if they have some sort of learning. John Locke, as I'll explain in a moment, uh, had a couple, uh, had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from uh, Oxford before he started studying med medicine there. And before he even taken any, attended any lectures at Oxford, his friends were already calling him doctor. Uh, why? Because, it, again, it's not a matter of having some expert knowledge. If you have any sort of traditional learning, you know at least something about the human body. You might be able to do something for someone. Uh, it's almost sort of analogous to the way that in, uh, in pre-Civil War uh, America, you have these plantation owners calling themselves Captain This and Colonel That because they served in the militia. Even though they never fought in the war, it's kind of that way. Anybody can sort of claim the title, basically. And so what were these people learning in the 17th century if they did study it? Um, they're learning what historians of medicine will often call library medicine. And as the name indicates, when you go to Oxford, as, as Locke does, you're not, you know, not like when you're going to be a nurse, you go on rounds, or you're going into a clinical or something like this. You're not going out and actually doing things. You're going into library to read books from the ancient authors, from the works of the Roman physician Galen, uh, the corpus of text associated with Hippocrates coming out of the ancient world. This is the basis for medical learning in the 17th century. And if you're wondering why, by the way, if it makes no sense, you have to remember, learning in general is not about getting expert knowledge. It's about acquiring this body of general knowledge and general wisdom, uh, which means coming from, again, these ancient works. Um, and it's from these ancient works that basically most of the basic ideas that people have about medicine come from, particularly associated with uh, Galen, is uh, the theory of humors. That there, your body is made up of four humors, right? The black and yellow bile, blood, and phlegm and that the reason why you get sick is because there's an imbalance of these humors, and so treating you is a matter of getting these humors back in balance, right? Um, the other sort of general idea people have in their minds is uh, something we could call more Hippocratic in, uh, in nature, is that uh, medicine, uh, sickness on the other hand, can be seen as um, the effects of external things on your body, um, the weather, uh, the time of year, things of this nature. Uh, and the, be the best way, of course, to heal yourself is to let nature take its course. This is a Hippocratic notion, which, as I'll explain in a moment, is something Locke actually uh, has in his uh, medical thinking. He thinks nature is uh, more powerful than we are, actually, in being able to heal people. Um, by the time Locke is uh, performing medicine in the 1650s uh, and 60s, there has been one major challenge, by the way, to these theories, and that challenge came from a 
a 16th century thinker named Paracelsus, uh, who is, tends to be the a father of what is called iatrochemistry. You can just call it chemistry for short, but uh, a chemical view of medicine, which sees the, the human body as a, a sort of, I don't know how to put this, a sort of cauldron of vital, spor vital spirits or vital forces, which, as the name implies, you treat chemically with chemical remedies. Uh, Paracelsus is big on this idea. He's uh, writing at the same time that um, uh, syphilis becomes a problem in Western Europe for the first time, and they use, of course, large amounts of mercury to deal with that, which you know, works in a way, but it also has uh, some rather bad side effects, um, to say the least. Um, but you have this emphasis on chemistry being a very powerful current cutting against uh, Galenic Orthodoxy in the uh, 17th century. Uh, and he will have Paracelsus, several uh, followers in the 17th century, whom Locke knows their works or knows them personally. All of whom, by the way, Paracelsus, uh, some of his followers, the Van Helmonts, Johann Baptista, and Franz, uh, Francis von Helmont, are people, I just, in passing, they're all basically religious mystics. They have a real weird, almost new age view <laughs> of the body and how it works. Uh, and so, again, it, it sort of gets into uh, some of these ideas they have. And so this matter of education plays into how medical practice plays out in the 17th century as well. Because if you go to Oxford like Locke did, you get your degree, you get your license, you are essentially a gentleman doctor whose main duty basically is not to actually go heal patients, work on their wounds. Uh, your, your job is to basically dispense uh, wisdom or advice taken from these ancient books. Um, there's a, there are, for example, official bodies of medicine. In London, there's a college of physicians, which is supposed to regulate and oversee the medical trade. Um, it has virtually no power to do so whatsoever. It can't regulate um, the marketplace, which is essentially a free-for-all in the 17th century. Uh, there is no regulation of medicine in the 17th century, basically. Uh, but these college of physicians are basically gentlemen doctors, and part of the reason they don't um, treat people in the way you'd expect is that, well, that's Treating people like that is a form of manual labor, and good gentlemen don't sully themselves with manual labor. So the people that most people would see, because you had to have money to pay for the, the, someone from the College of Physicians or someone from Oxford, would be either apothecaries. They're the ones, of course, who mix medicines and give you um, stuff that may or may not work to heal you, but it's at least something. Uh, or uh, surgeons. They're the ones who will bind your wounds cut off your limbs if need be, those sorts of wonderful things. And they are basically like uh, manual laborers. They, they don't go to college. They are apprenticed to other uh, apothecaries and surgeons like a guild. And so there's a, sort of a social separation between those different types of medicines on top of all this. But in fact, the, the most widespread medical practice for healing in the 17th century is none of these things. It's self-medication. People, when they were really sick, really hurting, would take whatever they could find, essentially. And you do have a lot of knowledge being passed down through families, through social networks, uh, of homeopathic remedies, of herbal you know, uh, remedies, stuff like this. In rural areas especially, women, of course, did this. They collected herbs and stuff like that. It's something they would do. And in fact, the things got really bad, none of these things worked, especially in rural areas you might go out and seek out someone who was learned in your village, someone who had been to college, someone who could do something about this. Um, this happens to John Locke at the end of his life. He's living in a rural area. People go and look, for, look to him for advice, basically. So it is very much an, uh, a sort of Wild West sort of environment for medicine in the 17th century. And as far as treatments go, uh, the, most, eh, the most famous treatments, a lot of the treatments have to do with and. They're based upon these Galenic theories of the body, things you've probably heard about, things like bleeding, uh, going to get bled by the surgeon or the barber so you can release some of those humors, right? The whole idea is to balance those fluids in the body. Things like purging, um, you're given emetics, so you vomit, and so that's another way to bring your humors into, into, into balance. Or blistering, uh, if you've ever seen the movie uh, The Madness of King George, they sort of heat up little glass bulbs and sort of put them on his back to blister his back. The reason you blister the skin is to sort of release the humors so that it can bring the, the body back into balance. Some of this stuff is kind of uh, unpleasant to think about. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that Locke did all of these things as a practicing physician during his lifetime. So um, uh, he's uh, treating the people just the way everyone else would have in that same period. Uh, and there were also chemical remedies, of course, that were popular in the 17th century. I've already mentioned mercury for syphilis. Um, they also had something uh, they called variously Peruvian bark or Jesuit's bark. 
I mentioned the Jesuits' name because it's kind of funny because uh, the bark actually comes from South America and so was associated with the Society of Jesus. Uh, but it was very useful in, in uh, stopping fevers, uh, mainly because it was full of the, uh, I think I'm mispronouncing this word, is it quinine? 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 I can't pronounce it, quinine. Uh, it was full of that particular uh, chemical which made it effective. And of course you had things to help people with pain, uh, particularly opium and laudanum, which uh, John Locke would use when, uh, a fair amount of if people were hurting uh, when he was treating them. And so finally, what does all this have to do with uh, faith or religion or Christianity? Um, well, there are several contexts in uh, the way that Christianity and religion, more generally speaking, fits into medicine in the 17th century. Um, the first are kind of institutional, I'd say. One is that uh, across Western Europe, you, you have hospitals, which the hospitals more or less trace themselves back to the medieval church, but uh, they're more prominent probably in uh, Catholic countries, the religious orders run them, but you have them in Protestant countries and um, in, uh, in England, certainly in the 17th centuries. You also have doctors um, uh, like Thomas Willis, who was one of Locke's teachers at Oxford, he's a very pious uh, Anglican, who uh, go around treating the poor for free and giving them free medical care. Why? Because they think it's a religious duty. It's an act of charity for them. So this happens on occasion. Um, more specifically, you will have, I, I mentioned this before, people in rural, area, rural areas looking for anyone they can find who's learned enough to actually do something about their, their illness. Well, in rural areas, the, the most learned people you can find normally are clergymen. And so in pretty much everywhere across Western Europe, Protestant, Catholic, England, France, uh, clergymen act as primary caregivers in a lot of rural areas, well into the 18th century, by the way. Um, anyone knows who John Wesley was, the founder of Methodism, um, a great preacher. He actually wrote a book called, I think it was called The Art of Physic, uh, in 1746, uh, giving his recipes for how to cure common ailments. Basically, I don't know if it was written for his priests, but uh, uh, it, uh, it shows you there's a real deep connection at an institutional level between uh, healing in the uh, Christian priesthood, and in general, of course, um, um, Christianity centered on Christ. He was a faith healer, he was a miracle healer. So you have those things sort of playing in the background of this in the 17th century. So how does all this play out in the life and the career of John Locke? Well, I'm going to start out talking about his, uh, his studies first, to give an idea of what he was studying medically at, this, at that time period. I mentioned he had a, a BA and an MA from Oxford. Uh, he achieves that by 1658. He returns in 1659 uh, and gets a studentship to study there. And a studentship is given so you can teach a little bit and they will continue your studies. Um, Locke seems uh, dead set on studying medicine, uh, as I'll explain in a moment. But the studentships were actually handed out to people with the expectation they would go on to study theology and take holy orders. They were meant to produce priests for the Church of England. And he apparently seriously thought about doing that at one point in his life. Let me keep in mind. Um, he eventually gets a dispensation getting him out of it, and so he doesn't do that. But it was part of his um, agreement initially when he was studying. And when you go to Oxford, as I've kind of indicated, the, the, the bachelor's curriculum, the regular curriculum is more about sort of, you know, great books and everything that's very structured. With these studentships, he kind of did what he felt like, more or less, uh, and dipped into studies on his own. Uh, and so he reads voraciously as soon as he gets to Oxford in 1659. Um, and uh, uh, in the period from 1659 to 1667, he reads about 350 books. About half of them are on medicine. Um, he also makes lists of piles of books he wants to acquire or read. And he makes a list of some 2,000 medical books that he wants to acquire in the same time frame. Uh, and at the end of his life, actually, uh, when the, his estate does an inventory of his library, uh, out of 3,500 books, about 11% of his library is um, made up of medical books and medical works. The most is actually theology at 24%, but still, uh, medicine's really, really important to him is my point. And so he's reading these works. He's reading all sorts of things. He's also keeping notebooks. I should uh, emphasize this because this is where we get a lot of evidence for his medical knowledge, his medical views are from his notebooks. And he keeps notebooks on everything you can think of, not just medicine, but on theology, on botany, um, everything. He's into a whole host of things. He is an intellectual pack rat, basically, and will write down more, uh, these things about anything. Um, but he also does attend lectures. He attends lectures on chemistry and medicine, um, actually, uh, the lectures with Thomas Willis in 1663 and 64. But he also meets and begins reading the works of one of the most influential figures of his life in 1660, and that would be Robert Boyle. If you don't know who Robert Boyle is, Robert Boyle is one of the major figures of early modern science. Uh, you've ever heard the term scientific revolution, sometimes applied to the 17th century Europe. 
He's one of its foremost uh, practitioners. Uh, he's doing experiments on all sorts of things in Oxford in the 1660s. Uh, and he befriends Locke. Uh, he comes into his sort of circle of um, uh, discussion. He has these discussion groups where they come get together every week and um, over ale discuss the experiments that uh, Boyle's been uh, doing uh, for that week, basically. Uh, and he imbibes, probably from him more than anything else, uh, a really big influence in his thinking, which is, can be called various things. In the 17th century, they call it the experimental philosophy. But I, I would call it Baconian empiricism, because this goes back to Sir Francis Bacon, the writer of the early 1600s, uh, who advocated a view of nature that you had to sort of, uh, the only way you could gain knowledge of the natural world was through detailed observation, not through theorizing, not through constructing systems of theory like the ancients had but through rigorous detailed uh, observation of phenomena, basically. Uh, and of course, doing experiments uh, to actually um, um, gauge that. Uh, and along with this at Oxford, partly through, uh, partly through Boyle, but also partly through the curricula because it was so important there, he did read a lot of works on iatrochemistry at the same time. Uh, he's reading works by Johann Baptista von Telmont, by other people who influence him in a, a sort of chemical direction and, in terms of uh, taking that into his, his medical views. Uh, and by the, uh, late, by the end of this period, in 1667, he's actually conducting his own medical experiments on respiration and on a whole lot of other things, botany, meteorology. He loved, like, he wrote down so many things about weather, taking down <laughs> notes on weather and temperature and all this stuff throughout his entire life, um, all with the help of Boyle. He would write to him and you know, get, his, you know, get his opinion of things. He was uh, very much uh, in need of his opinion at this point. Um, but in 1667, he abruptly, not abruptly, but he will eventually leave Oxford. Uh, he'll come back and get his medical degree in 1675, his BA. But uh, in 1667, something happens that kind of turns him away from medicine. It appears he's going to be a doctor at that point. Uh, and what happens is that he meets um, his political patron, um, who will change his life basically forever. And he's the reason why we actually know who John Locke is. Because um, he's introduced in 1666 by a colleague, uh, David Thomas, to Anthony Ashley Cooper. His name is Lothar Ashley at the time. He's known to history as the Earl of Shaftesbury. Uh, and if you don't know who he was, um, Shaftesbury, I'll refer to him, was, uh, is one of the most important political figures of the latter half of the 17th century in England. In 1667, he's a member of the King's Privy Council. Within five years, he'll be made an Earl by the King for his services. Uh, he'll eventually become the king's most deadly opponent. Uh, he'll raise what amounts to the first political party in Parliament to oppose uh, the King of England in the late 1670s, early 1680s. He'll bring the country to a brink of civil war. Uh, he'll lose and be sent into exile, along with John Locke, by the way, in 1680s. Um, my point is, basically, he makes John Locke as a political figure because he will come into his house. What happens in 1666 is they meet, they hit it off, they like each other. Um, the next year, um, Shaftesbury falls ill. He has an abscess on his liver, which he calls in various doctors he knows, trying to help him out. One of the people he calls in is Locke. And Locke helps assist with um, an operation by which they insert a, a silver tube into his side, into the abscess, to drain the fluid out of the, out of the liver, which it works. Uh, he has to keep that thing in his body for like six or seven years or something like this, but it works. Uh, and this deeply impresses uh, Shaftesbury, who invites him to come live in his household and be the family physician, which he does. So he moves to London in 1667. And one of the reasons this is so momentous, just in political terms, because it's in uh, Shaftesbury's house, he'll write all the great works I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, the two treatises, the essay, he starts writing there. Um, but it'll also be important for his religious and his medical um, views, because it's in this circle of people around the Earl of Shaftesbury that kind of um, at least I would argue, they um, shift him toward that more latitudinarian religious position I outlined, the one that will become uh, apparent in his mature writings in the 16, uh, 1670s and 80s. The Earl of Shaftesbury uh, had been someone who fought in the Civil War, uh, initially on the King's side, then he switched sides uh, during the war to be on the victorious parliamentary side. Uh, and uh, he had around him a lot of former parliamentarians, Puritans, but also dissenting Protestants. Um, because he was uh, someone who favored toleration for these sects. And so he was a patron of these people who were opposed to the religious settlement uh, that had been put in place at the Restoration in 1660. Um, he's also one of, one of the nearby neighbors, for example, uh, of, of uh, Shaftesbury in, in London, 
uh, was the Percy family. This is the uh, Earl of, Earls of Northumberland. They had also uh, been fought on the parliamentary side in the Civil War. Locke would actually assist them occasionally as a doctor as well. Um, so you have all these former parliamentarians, these former Puritans, these current Puritans uh, around him. This is also through Shaftesbury where he meets a lot of these latitudinarian clergy in the 1660s and 1670s. People like John Tillotson, who will become the Archbishop of Canterbury later on. Um, people like Edward Stillingfleet, who will become a bishop later on. And so he's in contact with people who are probably pushing him toward that position on toleration. They're probably also, and for reasons that become apparent, pushing him toward um, a particular view on medicine as well. Because the most important person that he meets in uh, Shaftesbury's household uh, is a man named Thomas Sydenham. And Thomas Sydenham is probably the most important uh, medical practitioner in 17th century England, maybe in uh, 17th century Europe. Uh, there aren't many real true medical innovations, uh, breakthroughs in the 17th century. He comes up with one of them. Uh, and he, like um, a lot of people around Shaftesbury, former parliamentary, uh, former soldier in the parliamentary army, Puritan, very pious Protestant, uh, like the rest of his friends. Uh, he's introduced uh, to, uh, 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 to Locke by John Mapletoff, who's another, another physician to the uh, Percy family. Uh, and they, hit, again, hit it off right away, uh, and Locke becomes his assistant. He assists him on his rounds when he's treating patients. Actually acts as his secretary uh, for a time as well. I'll come back to that, too, at the end of my lecture. And what's important about Sydenham uh, is a couple of things. <clears throat> one is that he is one of the first doctors who, when he's treating patients, in the, uh, treating patients, insists on writing down detailed observations of their symptoms over time. That is to say, he's the first person to know, well, maybe you should actually take, make a case history of all the things that have gone wrong with the body. Which, if you note, by the way, is essentially a Baconian sort of uh, idea in you know, empirical observation. Uh, and so he's kind of responsible for the first case history that's ever been written, essentially, as a matter of uh, method all the time when you treat someone. And he thought that diseases could be classified in the same way that botanists classified plants meaning that you could have a single species which had, which had lots of variations, but it remained the same species. And why that's significant is that, again, this Galenic theory of disease, where everything's, you know, sickness is caused by an imbalance in the humors, every disease is particular to the patient, which is to say there's no one cure that'll work on every patient because it's all particular. But if you identify the aspects of the disease that don't vary, you can potentially cure them. Uh, I mean, the disease itself, wipe it out, which he actually does. He's one of the people who advocates using Jesuits' bark uh, on fevers, which influenced them a lot because all of a sudden, hey, in all my patients, this fever starts going away. Um, so it leads to a distinction, uh, leads to the understanding of the disease as something extrinsic but also universal that you can track down and at least potentially cure in the 17th century. And there's a lot of, <clears throat> not a lot of, there's been some debate about the... Um, the question of influence between Sydenham and Locke, most people tend to think Sydenham was a bigger influence on Locke than vice versa. I tend to agree with that. <clears throat> but I would say, um, say this, that both of these men, when they meet, it's kind of a meeting of, the, of like minds. They're both on the same intellectual trajectory even before they meet. And when they come together, they're going to develop very, very similar beliefs. Um, I don't have time to go into this lecture, both religiously speaking and medically speaking. And I think they just sort of found someone that they were simpatico with. And I don't know if you can separate them in terms of um, the evidence we have, which the influence, which way it went. And so uh, last part of my lecture I'm going to come to is uh, the evidence for Locke's medical views and what evidence is there that they're actually influenced by um, his religious beliefs. Uh, and what evidence is there that he actually, maybe, maybe he is, maybe I'm wrong, maybe he is a radical medical thinker. And I want to start with his notebooks, especially his notebooks uh, from a later period, um, because they uh, contain some interesting things, the notebooks that are kept, his medical notebooks after 1675, because you do find some things in there, uh, some entries which are very fascinating, which, which seem like anticipations of modern medical ideas, modern medicine, modern treatments. Um, and he'll mention, by the way, in a long passage in one of his notebooks, that uh, he'll basically relay um, um, Sydenham's criti critique of contemporary uh, uh, medicine, that it's too much based on theory, needs to be reduced to observation, a few, ba a few basic rules based on observation, a certain method. Um, he, he basically is uh, uh, taking his uh, theory from him. Uh, but there are other items that are even more interesting than this. Uh, one entry in his notebooks from 1678 um, 
And he writes uh, in a way it's sort of question and answer, and he asks the question, could it be that inflammation of the skin, I, mean, I can't remember how he puts this, he's talking about infection, could be caused by the air, which of course is very close to suggesting that uh, infections uh, and wounds are caused by germs in the air. Uh, and so that's a very, it seems a fairly you know, um, astute observation for someone who's doing that in the 1670s and knows nothing about germs, right? Uh, and then an entry from 1683, he's mentioning, he talks about scurvy, he says, question, um, would it be possible to treat scurvy by giving people fresh meat and fruits and vegetables? Which, of course, is exactly what the British Navy will discover about 100 years later. You have a good supply of limes. Uh, you can live through it. You can get uh, your sailors healthy that way, right? Uh, and so there are things in there that sound like he is making a radical break with these theories or groping toward this. However, there are also a lot of entries in these notebooks, which and I shouldn't point out as a, in general terms. I can't go through all the, the examples. He's still writing and thinking in humoral terms. Uh, he uses the theory of humors. He's still treating people with, again, bleeding, blistering, purging, up to the end of his life, basically. Uh, he still has um, that Hippocratic idea that you know, nature takes its own course most of the time. He doesn't like, by the way, he says this to several of his patients, he doesn't like assigning uh, really strong drugs to them. He thinks you should let your body heal itself. Um, the advice he most often gives to his patients for recovery is get more rest and take long walks. Uh, that's very Hippocratic. And it's, by the way, still good advice. Just rest and take long walks is a pretty good idea, I think. Um, but he also writes down some things that at first glance don't seem necessarily like someone who is making a break with the past. I'll give you some examples. One, maybe not too critical uh, in terms of its importance. Uh, he records medical entries from ancient authors in these notebooks. Um, authors like Plutarch and Pliny the Younger. And people you would think, well, why is he, he's supposed to be throwing off these ancient theories, why is he doing this? But he does it. Um, he uses uh, certain remedies in the 17th century, which were common, but you would think, again, if he's, uh, if he's going to uh, make a, a, you know, a serious radical break with medical practice, he wouldn't be using. Uh, one example I found was very interesting. He um, treats the Countess of Northumberland, uh, the Lady Percy, in 1675 for trigeminal neuralgia. If you don't know what that is, that is a condition in which the nerves in your face, which connect, send message to your brain, are damaged and it's really painful, causes severe pain in the face and the head. Uh, he treats her with a mixture of uh, laudanum mixed with viper oil. And what that is, basically, people would take the skins of, of, of snakes and, and grind them up and make them into oil, which you just heard me correctly, he's treating her with snake oil. Um, so I, again, I don't mean to, I don't mean to I denigrate, it. that's what people did. He used the common remedies of the time himself. Uh, he notes, he didn't actually do this himself, by the way. He was noting somebody else did this. Um, the Earl of Shaftbury's wife, at one point, this is in 1681, um, was treated for kidney pains by the use of, does anyone know what transference is? This is the idea that disease, if you take, you know, if you take a lock of your hair and you wrap it up in something, you leave it out for someone, they, they grab it, the disease will transfer from one person to the other. It's almost, almost kind of like sympathetic magic, that she was cured using, like basically she had kidney pain, so she put urine in these quart jars and buried them in the ground. I don't know who came and dug them up, but apparently that was the way uh, that she was supposed to have been healed. And I say this, by the way, Locke is very terse in his entries. He doesn't comment almost anything he writes down. And he's usually very careful to note this, this idea came from this person, not from me. He never says, I agree or I disagree, but he's writing all this stuff down. Sometimes he does too, as well. Uh, probably the most fantastic or the most more surprising thing uh, in some of his notebooks is that in 1693, uh, he starts keeping a notebook dedicated to uh, alchemical cures. And by alchemy, I'm being pretty much what, what you think it is. There are, there are, this is I'm quoting for you, there are recipes in there for, quote, the transposing of metals, that is, turning lead into gold. Um, there's a recipe in there for, quote, a way to make a person return by natural magic, unquote. And then finally, one last one, I'm not gonna quote the whole thing, it's fairly long, but uh, there's a recipe for make, quote, making a toad or a serpent uh, out of dead, says dead ducks or dead geese, basically. So those are really odd and strange, obviously, to have in the notebooks of someone who is making you know, uh, innovative medical breaks, basically, with medical theory. So the question becomes, okay, how can you reconcile those seemingly contradictory things that we're finding in his notebooks? And the way I explain this, obviously, this is the point of my lecture, is, uh, are his basic religious beliefs, which, to get a sense of this, uh, you have to go back, and I sort of left this to the end, because I don't want to end with this. Um, 
Locke writes a few fragments of treatises on medicine where he expands on them in a, a more theoretical sense, all from the late 1660s. And it's in there where you get his basic beliefs about medicine. Um, and one of the things that emerges from these fragments, they don't amount to more than maybe 30 or 40 pages total. Um, uh, first of all, is a medical skepticism. Uh, and by medical skepticism, I mean not just about the prevailing theories about medicine, Galen, Paracelsus, so on and so forth, but a real skepticism about the possibility of even knowing the causes of disease. Uh, in Morbus, he, uh, uh, his earliest work called Morbus, he writes this before he meets uh, Thomas Sydenham, uh, he writes that you may be able to find a more rational theory uh, than you, from the Paracelsians or the, or the, or, or the Galenists, um, but he's not really sure he can actually do this. Uh, a work he writes a couple of years later called Anatomy on Anatomy is a really, really um, scathing denunciation of anatomy as being completely useless for, for healing patients. And it's kind of a surprising thing. You would think opening up bodies and seeing how they work would actually do some good. He says no, and the reason why, he thinks that, for example, things like the digestive system are so intricate, they're so complicated, the human mind is simply not capable of penetrating these things. The best we can do is observe the course of their uh, disease's development and then see what we can do to treat the symptoms and then cure that way, basically. Which again, you might think, well, that sounds very medically skeptical. That might be, you know, he is, you know, going against these ancient authorities. There's something like that that actually sounds, you know, radical if you want to put it in those terms. Um, but it actually goes back to, and this is the core of what I want to say, to his actual theological beliefs. Because um, the longest of these fragments that he writes is a treatise called De Arte Medica, which was intended to be a general work on medicine and really lay out the principles of how he thought medicine should go. I'm going to read from some of this, um, some of this here now uh, to give you an idea uh, of what he was writing in that work, because it explains better than I can um, what his, uh, I think, uh, the basis of medicine was for him. Uh, and at the beginning of it, he says that, quote, length of life with freedom from infirmity and pain, as much as the constitution of our frail composure is capable of, is so con great a concernment to mankind that there scarce can be found any greater undertaking than the profession of curing diseases. And I mention that because that passage is the first time I, saw, I find anywhere in Locke of the sense that, um, that sense that you know, happiness deals with pleasure and avoiding pain. Again, that ethical hedonism seems to be kind of uh, in embryo form there. Um, and he goes on to say, and I'm paraphrasing some of this, he goes on to say that the ancient authors originally did make contributions to medicine when it was based on their personal observation, but then it became overgrown with theories that were useless and things of this nature. Uh, and that they can still be useful if they are brought back into line with human experience. Um, but the real reason why these theories are never going to work is because basically he thinks they go beyond what the human mind can know about the body. And I have to quote some things in, uh, in, uh, in full here. Um, and he goes on to say, quote, but proud man, not content with that knowledge he was capable of and what was useful to him, again, observation, those sorts of things, would needs penetrate into the hidden causes of things, lay down principles and establish maxims to himself about the operations of nature, and then vainly expect that nature, or in truth God himself, should proceed according to those laws his maxim hath prescribed him. Instead of taking a close look at the actual phenomena in the world. People are inventing things in their heads and expecting nature and, by implication, God to go along with them. Uh, such that, I'm reading again, quote, a man must needs fashion all those out of his own thought and make a world to himself, framed and governed by his own intelligence. Uh, and he has in the facing page, by the way, this manuscript, he adds on the uh, opposite page, man by his desire to know more than was fit a second time lost the little remainder of knowledge that was left to him. That's almost certainly a reference to the fall of man, by the way. Uh, but he goes on to make even more explicit why he thinks we can't know the causes of diseases, ultimate causes of diseases, why we can't have total control over our life and health. And I have to read this uh, in full here. And he says, it is not to be hoped that the meanest disease should always obey the skill of the ablest physician, nor would such a vanity, vanity be tolerable in weak, ignorant men to pretend to be the dispensers of health and life that are the free gifts of Almighty God, and which, though his hand uncontrollably takes away or bestows where he pleases, yet he most commonly does it by uh, the intervention of fit secondary means. And obviously you can kind of see that's where I got the title of my talk from. Um, uh, and the language of you know, free gifts 
uncontrollably. Again, this, I come back to this. This is the language of a God who is mostly defined by power, what he can do. God has laid down these laws. He's laid down these boundaries for our knowledge. You can't hope to trespass on it this way. Uh, and he, Locke goes on to say, by the way, a physician may in some cases assure a sick man of recovery, unquote, but, quote, not by any power or authority of his own over the nature of things, but by a right application of those remedies which were ordained for producing such effects. For Locke, what amounts to the laws of nature in some ways are those senses of pleasure and pain that he puts into our, into our bodies. Those are like laws that he lays down. Uh, and that's why you have to sort of follow all the observations of your senses really closely. You have to follow the laws that he lays down attentively in order to get health, which are his gifts. Just in the same way, by the way, I, I bring this up because he knows the letters of Paul very, very well. St. Paul, a uh, letter to the Romans, talks about grace being a free gift of God. So just the same way that sort of health is a, a, a gift of God, salvation is, and you know them the same way, through pleasure and pain, that sort of, hide, that sort of hedonistic motivation which uh, allows you to seek health, but also allows you to seek the eternal rewards and avoid the eternal punishments that God's put in place. Uh, and so what I'm basically saying here is those contradictions you saw, I, I listed in his notebooks, are of someone who is um, basically open to things maybe we wouldn't be open to, obviously, in a modern setting. Why? Locke doesn't think he knows enough to, um, uh, to rule them out. It's not his place to sort of go, you know, I don't know, maybe this the stuff actually works. Maybe this can actually work. Uh, he doesn't know enough to sort of uh, say for sure. And he does this a lot, by the way, throughout the rest of his philosophy. Takes a real, um, you could call it strategic agnosticism uh, toward those um, areas of thought which would, might possibly trespass on these, this sort of religious notion that you're trespassing on the, on the laws of the lawgiver. Um, and so I see, I see anyway, a relationship directly between his theological voluntarism and his empiricism and his hedonism, and between uh, his uh, religion and uh, his medical views, which is why I say even though, yes, he is a thinker who is trying to think outside the box, he is someone who, you know, uh, he is trying to look for these things, trying to look for new, new, um, new remedies, a new way of doing things. He doesn't find it, obviously. And it should be kind of obvious. I say this because I didn't get into the historiography of this uh, in this lecture. Maybe next week when I give it to the faculty and students, I'll do this. Um, historians, when they talk about Locke, even though they quite readily admit that he came up with no new cures, no treatments, didn't really do a whole lot in practical terms, they tend to lump him into what they call the medical enlightenment. And I think this is a mistake. Uh, just because he was in one area, uh, I don't think that means he was in all these other areas as well. I think he was, had very specific reasons, which I don't want to go into for, these, uh, for doing that in these other areas. So in sum, uh, Locke was probably not as radical a thinker uh, as we might, uh, might supp uh, suppose, given the rest of his achievements uh, as a philosopher. Um, and that, as they say, is that. Um, we, have, uh, we have time for yeah, just time questions. We have a few minutes for questions if anybody has uh, Anything you want to ask or complain about or <laughs> things they want to throw at me? I don't know. Not tomatoes, please. Uh, this gentleman and Andy, yes. Talk about blistering. Yes. I know you're not a medical expert. I am not. But in the Olympics, you saw <laughs> evidences of, and you see a lot of other evidence of people using cupping to. Really? Stimulate certain muscles and mm. move some of the. Interesting. Uh, well, it's interesting they use the same methods, but for different reasons. But yeah, I mean, it is, it, it's weird. Certain practices remain, they're used for different reasons, perhaps. But uh, I, did, I did not know that, actually. They did that for Olympic athletes. Of course, the, they, they have other things that they're doing sometimes <laughs> that uh, maybe aren't above board. But yeah, I had not, I'd never heard of that, actually, and doing cupping that way. Um, but yeah, yeah, at least they're not trying to get the humors out of their body or whatever, right? Uh, and yeah. Well, thank, thanks, Derek. I was, you know, I was wondering, you mentioned that Locke is very much from the school at the time of like experience or his theology was like kind of observation of the senses, which was opposed to Aquinas who had the theology of reason mm -hmm. to simplify it. I was wondering, like, what, you know, if, if the medical enlightenment was approaching, mm -hmm. is it a leap to say that eventually the 
um, theology of Aquinas won out in this regard, in, in the sense that now they, they believe that you can understand the world or you know, reason could? Um, not, uh, not exactly. I mean, um, the problem with Locke is that he's, and they should have gotten this in my, uh, my lecture if you didn't know, Locke was actually really skeptical about human reason. Uh, I know he's, again, the light midst, you know, defenders of individual reason against authority and tradition. He was that to a certain degree, but he actually didn't think very highly of it. So I guess maybe in that sense, to a degree, because Aquinas had more confidence in it. There's no doubt about that. Um, but in a, in a sense, there's so much between, like this is, this is kind of the debate that I have a problem with. Uh, you know, enlightenment medicine for me starts in the latter half of the 19th, 18th century. It really has nothing to do with the 1700s, or the 17th century, I should say. Uh, and I'm not sure it has much to do directly with those, those debates by then. It has to do with, poli actually it's political, actually. The French Revolution is really what revolutionizes uh, modern medicine in a lot of ways. But in the sense that, yeah, you can see a more, it's kind of hard to explain, locked, uh, yeah, that more, I'll say this, a, a greater confidence in reason, yeah, it won out eventually, certainly. Because Locke is very skeptical, uh, more skeptical than I probably made clear in my lecture about a whole host of things. Um, I, again, people need to have a misim, uh, misimpression about what he was like. So, in a sense, yeah, if you can say Aquinas was redeemed. So you're just um, saying it, it took a lot longer, like it was much further Yeah, in fact, remember, especially uh, when we were talking about medical breakthroughs, they're mostly not a matter of, of theorizing or philosophy. They're a matter of people doing things on the ground. And so uh, they're not necessarily, not necessarily connected to, they may be um, um, in some ways uh, related to these types of debates. I'm sure they are. I wouldn't know the answer to that, but, uh, but yeah, I think uh, Locke was not terribly optimistic about these things, and the more optimistic view of human reason, which there were plenty of other Enlightenment thinkers who were uh, optimistic about it, won out. Uh, but yeah, well, you want to say that Aquinas is vindicated, I'll go with that. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I think uh, you did a wonderful job of showing us just how confused for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, this medical language is in this, mm -hmm. this time period. Oh, sure. And do uh, you see that, um, that, I guess the, we've almost made a caricature of Locke, you know, yes. as a, what, I guess a post-enlightenment sort of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, any uh, I mean, Sydenham, you brought Sydenham, I was, I was amazed by the, uh, I guess the influence that Sydenham had on Locke in terms of this observation and, and case history so mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might uh, say a word or two about that in relation to say, you know, Locke and what he develops later on in his empirical mm -hmm. works. Sure. Um, I didn't get a chance to use it, but um, there's an undated manuscript in Sydenham's, uh, uh, his, uh, his papers, which uh, Kenneth Dewhurst, who published a lot of Locke's notebooks, published um, some of his works as well. Uh, and it's a work on natural theology called the, uh, Theologis uh, Naturalis Theologi Theologia Naturalis. And it outlines a theory of, of natural religion or natural theology, which is almost identical to Locke's later religious beliefs. It mentions the ethical and uh, psychological hedonism. It mentions uh, the necessity of eternal rewards and punishments. It mentions all that stuff's in there. And I wish, I, I almost want to go look at it and see if I can date it because it's so, it really is, I don't know, I, 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 for, the, for my argument, I don't think it matters, but I'd love to know who came first. But I, I really think they were people who found themselves at the right time. They were already developing that. Uh, I suspect the theological aspects of it are Locke and not Sydenham. Um, what I think Sidden, uh, Locke gets from Sydenham, and I can't prove this at all, uh, and I kind of mention it here, I think the idea of doing medicine as a duty from God, and, and um, again, things I don't have time to quote, at the beginning, at the uh, introduction to one of uh, Sydenham's works, he actually comes out and explicitly says, healing is a divine duty laid on by the creator and all this other stuff. And Locke never writes anything like that. But you have to remember Locke, when I say Locke, it's a metaphor, but he does practically worship Thomas Sydenham. In his notebooks, whenever he writes, about, he'll write about um, his method. He'll talk about um, Sydenham's method. He'll do this with a shorthand where he says uh, in Latin, M-E, and those letters stand for Methodus Asclepius, the method of Asclepius, the goddess. He's calling, he's comparing Sydenham to Asclepius. Um, at the beginning of, um, uh, at the epistle to the reader in the essay concerning human understanding, Locke will mention uh, three great intellectual uh, pioneers of the 17th century, which he says he can't approach. You know, you can't hope to be like these three men. And the three are Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, 
and Thomas Sydenham. And I mention that because I think what's, what's going on, to go back to Ryan's question, with that influence, and it's a guess at this point, um, Locke has found someone who his intellectual beliefs match up, his religious beliefs match up, but I think, I suspect, I can't say, if you notice what all those three men have in common besides the fact that they're really brilliant, uh, Locke and Newton and Sydenham, they're all deeply devout in a way Locke is not. And it would not be the first time someone who was not a true believer but had the same beliefs really admired the other people because they were true believers. It happens, by the way, outside of religious uh, context, you know. So, uh, but I think that's as much as anything. I think they fed each other that way. Um, the true believer being fed by someone who was more brilliant in Locke. Um, at least that's my hypothesis going forward anyway. I don't want to keep anybody longer than we have to. It looks like people may want to take off and shut down. So. Uh, and there was a KU game, so you guys, it's not over yet, so you guys can make it. So if there's nothing else, I will let my people go. And thank you all for coming uh, again. I very much appreciate it.